Um, I'll just introduce myself. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Carolyn Ray. I'm the CEO and editor at Journey Woman. Just do a land acknowledgement, which is really important to me to acknowledge um, that the land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations. And we wish to acknowledge and thank the first peoples of this territory and other indigenous peoples for sharing this land in order for us to do our work today. For those of you that might be new to Journey Woman, we're just about to celebrate 30 years next year in 2024 of being the world's first publication for solo women. Uh, we've got a number of things that are going on. If you're, uh, and there's practically something every day that, or every week that you can uh, get involved in. Um, not only do we have this call tonight, on Thursday night, we have a call on accessible travel, which is not a webinar, it's more of a discussion uh, to talk about how we can make uh, travel more accessible. So the full spectrum of mobility. And those are really casual, um, in, informal discussions. On June 21st, the third Wednesday of every month, we have our book club. And this month's book is called The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abby DeRay. And if you haven't read it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful read about Nigeria. I really recommend it. But we have great books lined up for most of this year. We also have a community call on the 29th of June. So those generally happen around the last week of the month. And then we're in the process of organizing some meetups in different cities around the world uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, if you're in those regions. Um, Karen is going to be in Vancouver and Victoria at the end of the month. And here in Toronto, uh, Diana Eden, our Women Over 80 writer, will be here in Toronto. We're just in the process of setting up a dinner. And then we also are doing a hike the first week of July with Wild Women Expeditions called the Move for Freedom Walk, which is to raise funds to prevent human trafficking and support, um, support those who have been through that. So we also have a private Facebook group if you're not on that. And we also have a women's travel directory that can help you find uh, hopefully cost-effective and safe uh, tours for women. So, um, so I wanna start with just a bit of a poll as we get going and I'll see if I can get this all to work about how many of you have, um, have actually, you know, solo traveled on your own, whether it's in a group, but I, what I mean is independent travel on your own, going somewhere, whether you're meeting, uh, meeting somebody or not. So, and I'm particularly interested because we want to see if this discussion, those of you that might be new to it are, um, we can change your mind and help you, um, help you gain confidence. Looks like most of the women in this group have, have already, Done it and love it. Well, that's fabulous. Okay, well, Karen, then it's easy, right? <laughs> Piece of cake. Um, so 87, 82% have done it and love it. 6% not sure yet. And 12% want to travel solo. Well, that's great. So, um, so Karen is our special guest tonight. And Karen has been uh, part of uh, the Journey Woman community for a long time. In fact, she's one of our contributors now. So she's writing for us on a regular basis. Uh, she wrote her first article in April 2021 about chronic pain in Iceland. And um, and then I think the lot, there was one on Antarctica, there was one on, uh, well, you know, we're really trying to focus on quirky and less traveled places. So um, so if you haven't read her stories, please do there. I just love, uh, love reading them. And she also published her first book, Travel Mania. Was that last year, Karen, or am I getting my years 20, mixed up? It was um, 21. Okay, I'm getting, years. I've lost a year. <laughs> um, and we talked about that book as well when she created it. And, and so tonight we're going to talk about her brand new book, which I think is available in ebook. And, no, no, and no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct you. It okay. is advanced. It's, you can buy it. You can put an order in advanced copy, but you can't get it yet. Okay, it but not October available yet. Okay, October. So this is a real preview then of, uh, of what's coming up in the book. And uh, so Karen and I are going to have a little chat and we encourage you to put any questions in the chat or save them up and we'll open it up. And, you know, Karen's been to over 90 countries. She's been traveling solo since she was 17. She's just a wealth of information and knowledge. And, uh, and I'm so glad to have her here with us tonight. So thank you, Karen. My pleasure. Absolutely. And I see lots of it. What's really interesting for me 
a lot of people have been commenting on what I've written. And so I know the names, but not the faces. So it's nice to see both. Really nice. That's great. So I'm going to just spotlight you and I'm going to spotlight me. Is that working? It is. Are we both spotlighted? Yes, you are. All right. Yay. <laughs> well done. Well done, me. So let's start off just talking a little bit about how you got started in solo travel and what that was like at age 17. Well, um, if you read the first book, you'll know some of the story of this. I had had, I was going to school at Pratt, which is in Brooklyn, New York, in what was one of the worst neighborhoods in the city at the time. And it was, I was way too young. I had skipped school, a year of school, and then I had skipped another year. And then I would, you know, just my whole background, I was very young when I graduated, took a, a year in, um, in college and said, I got to get out of here. So I worked for a year, got money and said, where can I go to put a lot of distance between me and my family and New York? And I ended up first in the Netherlands and that was not a great fit either. So I ended up going to London where I spent three years and that was just an amazing experience. And after that, I could go anywhere. Um, and the, uh, when I went back, came back to the States and to go to college, um, I was studying ceramics, which is certainly an interesting major to have. And my professor <clears throat> had gone to Japan the first summer between my uh, sophomore and junior years. And he came back with these amazing stories. And I said, I have to go see this for myself. So off I went to Japan. Um, I, I had a friend with me, but we were, this was 1973, I think. And there was no English anywhere. And we managed to get all around the country with no problems. And I figured after that, if I could get around Japan, not knowing the language, um, I could pretty much get anywhere. Gave me a lot of confidence. And after that, it was just like, I'll go anywhere, whether I know the language. And I've been to countries where I literally knew nothing about it because it happened so fast that I was reading the guidebooks on the way down to the country so that I would have at least some idea of where I was going. We were talking right before this call about what's changed in travel and how it used to be compared to how it is now. What would you what would you say are the top things that you've noticed have changed in the last uh, few decades? Well, the biggest thing is having a phone. No question about it. The phone can be your camera. I no longer carry a camera and 20 rolls of, of film. Um, I no longer <clears throat> need to have, I used to have all these little books that had, you know, phonetic translations so you could say some basic things. It's all on the phone. Um, everything you can think of, you know, directions, if you want information, unless you're in somewhere extremely remote and even places where I thought it was very remote, I could get reception and, and use the phone. <clears throat> it brings you a wealth of information. And, and it's both good and bad because you're less likely to get into trouble. And I like getting into trouble. I like getting <laughs> lost. <laughs> When you get lost, interesting things happen and I no longer get lost very often. Um, the other thing that's changed, and I was talking about this right before I got on the call, was everybody remember traveler's checks? Um, when was the last time you used a traveler's check? And it used to be cash was king and you get those traveler's checks and immediately get the money, whatever the local currency was. Nobody does that, anymore. no one. And in fact, in most places, they don't want cash. You can go an entire trip just with your phone and using that to pay for yeah, things. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. you know, I, I remember being, and this was in 2012, I think, uh, being in uh, Seoul, South Korea, and we went into a coffee shop because I changed money. We were just getting coffee, and I handed the, the barista, you know, some, some cash, and she looked at it, had no idea what to do with it literally had no idea what to do with it and brought the manager over and like, what do I do with this stuff? 
Um, and finally, I ended up using a credit card because she was so confused by it. And that was, you know, 11 years ago. And the world is going that way. You know, and I was in London, very beginning of this year. I went over, I had a slew of cash on me. And I ended up coming back with a slew of cash because nobody wanted it. Yeah, and, and it's that, tap all the way now in London, I think. That was, that was my experience too. Yeah, but they wanted a credit card, you know. And now you get email. Anybody remember going to the American Express office to go pick up your mail in those little blue aerograms? I mean, that was, you know, I, I yeah. everybody sent me stuff in various cities to the American Express office. And as long as you had traveler's checks, you were officially a, a, a client and therefore you could use it as a mail drop. Um, you know, yeah. so every, just about everything has changed in terms of what the it, logistics. Yeah, the, yeah. And when, what about safety, do you think? Because, you know, there's still, it's interesting. I still, people ask me, oh, the world feels so safe. It must be so easy for women to travel solo. Yeah, the survey that we just did, safety was the number two, you know, decision criteria that we're using when we make travel decisions. So how do you feel about your personal safety when you're traveling now compared to before? I feel safer, I think. Um, <clears throat> again, because of the phone in, in large part, because um, I can get out of situations and I'm not going to get lost. Um, I also think that in general, the world is safer. You hear, you know, if you watch the news, you don't think that. But if you actually go places, you do. Um, I have not felt in any way, shape, or form threatened in the last 10 years. And I've been to some fairly unusual places and a lot of them by myself. Uh, not, it's just not a big issue for me. The one time that I felt very, very nervous traveling, I was staying at the most expensive hotel in the city because it was a business trip in Sao Paulo. And mm. I became a target. If you walked out the door, people were there watching to see who went out the door. But normally I'm not staying at the most expensive hotel in the city. I'm staying at, you know, a moderately priced place that's off the beaten path and nobody cares. You know, if you yeah. don't flaunt it, nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna care. The yeah. only place I ever got robbed was in Japan. And, and of course they couldn't use anything because it was the, at the time that the credit cards had a picture of you on it. And even if it didn't, what Japanese person could get away with a card that said Karen Gershowitz? And the answer is no one. <laughs> you know, that was not going to happen. Um, no. It was an inconvenience and I didn't have my passport with me and I lost some money, but that was the only time I've ever been robbed. And, and that's the country that everybody feels the safest. In. Yeah, so yeah, it's funny, eh? Just never yeah. Know. Well, I, I want to get right into some of the stories in your book, and um, and I I had the the privilege of reading it a few months ago when you um, I think I have a very rough draft actually a, an unproofed draft. Yes, you and do. I <laughs> laughed my way. <laughs> I laughed my way through all of them um, because I could just. I, I had just come back from the Czech Republic. So that story in particular was funny to me because I thought, oh my gosh, it hasn't really changed at all. <laughs> but um, but this book is a little, you've got a lot of, it's called, by the way, Wanderlust, Extraordinary People, Quirky Places and Curious <laughs> Cuisine. There you go. And, and so there's, you're kind of bringing together three things here. And of course the food is interesting because you've had some pretty unusual or said no to some re really unusual uh, types of food. What what kinds of memories uh, do you write about in this book that might be interesting for us to hear about? Well, I, I always tell a story about the absolute worst meal I ever had. And there was no choice. I was in Tanzania and this was the cheap Charlie version of a safari because I had no money at the time, but determined to go. And we were in some fairly beat up, I think they were British um, surplus tents and such. And uh, we were out in the middle of the Ngorogoro crater and we came back from a drive and we're getting ready for dinner. And there was literally a shriek. I mean, I thought, good God, somebody's just gotten, you know, there's a, there's a lion in the camp, something has happened. And we all go running out to see what's going on. And the, the tour guide says, no, no, it's okay, don't worry. 
it's all going to be fine. Go back. I'll, I'll let you know when dinner's ready. Well, when we finally got to dinner, it turned out that the instructions that the tour guide had given to the, um, to the chef um, were not exactly followed because Tanzanian food has nothing to do with Western food at all. Um, they eat a kind of gruel and they put vegetables on it. Western food is just not, it's not nothing that they would know. It would be like asking me, you know, to prepare a meal in Borneo. You know, I, I wouldn't know what to do. Anyhow, we had this bowl, very large bowl, that was filled with salad and meat. And um, then he had put fruit salad on top, tinned fruit salad with the, with the sweet syrup on top of it, and then decorated it with sardines. And we all took one look at this. What he had done is taken what were supposed to be three separate dishes and made it into one huge bowl. And it had the sardine, oh, uh, and there was condensed milk. So it was condensed milk and sardine juice all poured over it. <clears throat> and we all took one look and went, oh God. You know, yes, I, how could we I haven't had dinner yet tonight. So. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that is just, you know, was, so we're sitting there pulling out things that we thought might be edible and cleaning them off. <laughs> because you didn't eat that, there was nothing else to eat. So that, yeah, that was yeah. the absolute worst meal I have ever had. And then you some of the talking, um, some yeah, of the titles say. here, just just for folks to there's deep fried frog. That's one of your chapters. Yes. Well, and then you that's and I were talking about I never spectacular, I think was an, is I assume that's about potatoes. Um, actually, no, it's about very large things. Oh, OK. For Cod's Sake, Newfoundland, Canada. Yeah. Taste of the Sea. That was uh, one of that was one of the absolute best foods. That was in Hokkaido, um, which is the northernmost part of Japan. And I happen to love sushi and I love Japanese food. And if you've had sushi, you know they sometimes put roe on the top of the sushi. It's those little orange. Well, what we get in this part of the world compared to what you get there has no resemblance to each other. And uh, my friend Judy, who is on the call here somewhere, and she can attest to this, we, we went um, hiking, came back, and the only place that we could eat was the ferry terminal. And I'm looking at going, oh God, this is gonna be awful. Well, one of the things was an entire bowl of roe with rice. And I looked at it and said, I must have this. And it was like biting into the sea. It was the best tasting stuff. And I thought, oh my God, this is never going to happen again. And then the next morning at the hotel, they had a buffet. And the buffet had was all Japanese food because we were the only Westerners there. And um, I'm looking around. And then I see there is, if I thought the other bowl was big, this was like this kind of bowl filled with roe. And I'm thinking, and it's very expensive. I think. I'll take a tablespoonful. I can't be greedy. I can't be a horrible American. And then I see the guy standing next to me fill up a soup bowl with this stuff. Okay, if he can do it, I can do it. And it turns out that the guy was a professor of English at the university in Kyoto. We ended up talking and having this great conversation. But it was, he, he said that every year he and his wife went up there specifically to get the roe, salmon roe because it was the only place you could get it and afford it. And this hotel had this big bowl. That was their reason for traveling, you know, 500 miles. And so I was not alone in, in you know, really loving this, but it was, it was an unexpected and truly wonderful meal, so. What about um, the most unusual place that you've been to that you talk about in your book? Oh, there's a bunch um, of them. One of them is Andamuka. Andamuka is in the, um, it's a, an opal mining town in Australia in the outback. And it's a town of, I think, 25 or 30 people, maybe. And the reason that it's so small is because during the summer, it can get to 140, 150 degrees. And it is, um, it's not a place that's easy. But some of the best opals on the globe come from there. Well, we were supposed to go on, I was supposed to go on a tour 
And it turned out that everybody else canceled except the person I was traveling with and myself. And so we went in a little four seater plane to the middle of nowhere. And I'm looking down at the window and I don't, I don't know how this guy is seeing where we're going. So we asked the pilot, you know, where, how do you know where we're going? And he says, you see that road? Sort of. He said, oh, well, that's the road we're following. I said, well, what happens when there's a dust storm? It's harder, was his answer. <laughs> and, I bet. Yeah. And, and when we got there, it was literally one wind sock and we bounced down the, you know, what is the runway. And we are in the middle of nowhere, literally the middle of nowhere. I don't see anything. And eventually a, a beat up old station wagon, you know, comes up to us, says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I had something in the oven. I couldn't leave. Um, and we go back to town. The town is maybe 15 houses. And what I quickly learned was they look like little shacks. And that's because most of the home is underground because mm. that's where it's cooler. And so you're in rooms that have no windows and, you know, teeny tiny. And when they want to dig for more opals without having to get permission from the government, they just do an extension to their home. They build another room, which they're allowed to do. Uh, and it was what I tell a lot about what happened when I was there, but that was definitely one of the more remote places I've been. To. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm mm -hmm. sure it is still very, very. Remote. Um, what about in the U.S.? Because you've got a lot of stories here um, about the U.S., well, when I was 50, I took a year off and I drove around the country, parts of Canada, but mostly in the U.S., and started going to places that I knew I wanted to see that were very difficult to get to. And, and I have stories about a few of them in here. Um, one of them has to do, and, and there was a story in the last book as well, because it really struck me was, um, now I'm going to lose the name of it, but it was in the, the rock that was in, or the mountain that was in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I was determined to go see it. And that's another place that when you go there, you understand why it was in the movie. There is nothing around for 50, 60 miles. And then there's this incredible Devil's Tower, thank you. Um, that's right in the middle of you know nothingness. And that was a fabulous place to visit absolutely fabulous and I and you know being I had a friend who um lived on a compound in Montana she we got to college together and she gave me the directions and when I got there the town it was the town of Harpole which was her husband's name and uh it had about 12 houses but they don't live in town they live in the suburbs of Harpole, which meant driving on I, I hate to call it a road because it was not. It was tracks through that went winded their way through woods for about five miles. And I got out there and her husband likes to build. So there were about 14 or 15 different buildings. They had no electricity, no running water. The running water came through a, 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 literally a garden hose. And they'd been living like that for 20 years, raised their kids there. Um, it was a, it was a, an experience and I, you know, we all have heard the term compound and you think of the Unabomber. In my case, I think of Lisa and this place that was in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Unbelievably beautiful, but they get snow. They were getting snow. Um, the last snow they had the year that I was there was June 10th and I was there about the 20th. And it was, you know. Was June, did you say? Yeah, June. I think some of us up in the northern parts can maybe relate to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what? you know, and one other small detail. So they have all these buildings because she's a, a ceramicist. So she had her studio and her kiln building. I said, how do you even get to these buildings during the winter when there's all this snow and wind and horrible weather? She said, oh, we tie ropes up between the buildings and we hold on to the rope to go from building to building. And I'm going, oh, I, don't, I can't even imagine living yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about curiosity because I think 
you know, this is an attribute that you have and like, I just can't get out. Like also, cause you, you, you're one of those people that goes out into the world with an open mind and you're always coming back with all kinds of learnings and lessons from your travel. But how would you describe, you know, the importance of curiosity and, and what other things have you learned from your travels? To me, curiosity is kind of the secret sauce for travel. Um, if you go to check things off the list, that's what you'll end up doing. If you are genuinely curious and open to things, things happen. And you also have to be willing to go with things that are not on the schedule. And to me, those are the most fun parts. Just serendipity. Um, I will go anywhere at any time as any of my friends can attest to. I am the first person they call, they wanna go somewhere, hey Karen, do you wanna to go to? And my answer usually is when? Um, <laughs> How long do I have to pack my bag? <laughs> yeah, uh, so basically <laughs> yes. And if I read about something and I get curious about it, I'll go. Um, I went um, to some of the more remote places in Indonesia because I'd read an article in National Geographic. And I thought, oh my God, this looks incredible. I have to go see it for myself because this isn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it really wasn't. And it was one of the more fascinating trips I've ever taken, um, just wandering around. I often go with you know, no hotel reservations, nothing. The first night, I always have a reservation the first night. And after that, I frequently don't have reservations and, and just, you know, I will find somewhere because I'm not traveling during, you know, I don't go when everybody else is traveling. Yeah, typically. yeah. And I like just wandering around. You know, I learned there's a story in here about being in Switzerland and it's not the point of the story, but um, I, I met a whole group of Swedish students and I was traveling by myself and they kind of adopted me. And... <clears throat> We're walking around town and they said, oh, there looks, looks like a good bus. Let's get on the bus. I said, where are we going to? I don't know, but let's get on the bus. We'll find out. And this was when I was 20, maybe. And it turned out to be great fun. And I do it all the time now. You know, if I see a bus, I'll get on a bus. I don't know where it's going. Um, you know, it's got a name of somewhere. And if something looks interesting, I get off the bu bus and walk around. And um, I was with a friend in Berlin and we did that and we discovered this whole monument to um, the wall, which we did not know existed. Um, and only because we had gotten on this, this trolley, I think. And, you know, wherever it ends up, it ends up. And to me, that's kind of the essence of it. If you have a plan and you feel like you must stick to your plan, that's what you're going to see. And you're not going to see where people really live and how they you know, what life is like in a place as opposed to what the tourist attractions are. And I understand yeah. everybody has to go see certain tourist attractions. I do too. You know, it's not like I'm going to miss going to the Eiffel Tower the first time I go to Paris. But after I've seen that, I want to do some off the beaten track stuff. So Yeah. And what are your tips to uncover those things, you know, wandering, but any other tips for, oh, especially yeah. for, you know, those of us who might be a little introverted, right? And not quite ready to rush into places and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. My, my big tip to everyone is, what are you interested in? What's the thing that's really you're passionate about, apart from travel? Well, I happen to love arts and crafts. Um, I'm not a foodie per se, but I like going to unusual local restaurants. Um, I love theater, dance. So I will plan to see what is going on in a place that has to do with the things that I'm interested in. And read a local newspaper. Now, if you're in another country, you're not gonna be able to read it, but you can do it on your trusty phone. Look up events. What's happening in the place you're at? And if there's a concert, go to the concert. And especially if you're on your own, people will talk with you. Mm -hmm. They won't talk with you if you're two people because then you're a group. But if you're on your own, everybody starts to talk to you. I've sat in places where, you know, I want to have a conversation and I'll sit there reading a book 
that's in English and make sure that the title is out so they can see that it's English. And people will come over because they want to practice English, especially go to a university and sit on a campus reading a book in English. You can be anywhere in the world and I guarantee that students will come over to talk with you because for mm -hmm. them, they get to practice English. It's, it's a, it's a two-way street. And I've had students take me to all kinds of places that I would never have found on my own, not a chance. And only because I sat there reading a book and looked friendly. Um, part of it is just being open to it. And, yeah. and, you know, and, if you're, and if you are introverted, you, know, you need to get a little bit out of your shell. The other thing is if you're really nervous about it, find a small group. There's lots of tours. And if you, um, you know, go with a, a group that's got 12 or 16 or 18 people and people will talk. Um, and be very friendly, mm -hmm. but, but go off on your own a little bit. It's, it's, you know, I, I was just on a trip. Uh, I just came back from Tuscany and I was on a cooking tour, which was wonderful. I now have everybody saying, so when are you cooking dinner for us? Which <laughs> I will do, which I will do. They already know they have invitations. Um, but, um, it was fabulous, but we had enough time and I didn't go off with the other people in the group. I went off by myself, you know, just walking around. And there was one shop that I went into and the person spoke perfect English and was really friendly and really helpful. And he said, oh, you gotta go see this and you gotta go see that. And, and he gave me a whole itinerary of things to do. Um, you know, I had, I don't know, three, four hours and I could have gone for two days on his recommendations that were quite different than what was on the tour. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that that becomes another way to do it. It's just even if you're with a group of people, you can stand to be three, four hours on your own, knowing that you're going to come back to a group. But that's a way to kind of get the experience of what it's like to be out on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's got questions for Karen, but um, if you want to put a question, any questions in the chat, um, we can take those at any time. Um, I'm curious too about, so you, you must journal every day when you're traveling, like you must be yeah. writing stuff down. Um, and I know you publish, you know, most of the time you're, you publish every day, something on uh, Facebook. Um, but how do you create that discipline of writing down stuff every day? Do you, do you take around a notebook? Do you do it on your, like, what's your process for that? I have a laptop that I bring with me. I used to handwrite everything. My, I should say, my mother got me doing this when I was eight years old. You know, talk about having a long history. Mm -hmm. People sometimes say, how do you remember all this stuff? Well, anybody who's ever traveled with me knows that I write every single day. I never, I do not go a day without. And I'm not writing, I went to this restaurant and I stayed at this hotel. I honestly don't care about that. What I do care about is what did I see that was unusual? What, what experience did I have? What feelings did I have? Um, and absolutely no question about it. That was, my mother got me started on it and I have kept it up and, and it's part of my routine and I can't even imagine traveling, writing stuff down. So yeah. I don't, I don't know how to get you started except to say they don't have to be long entries. That doesn't have to be perfect English. It doesn't have to be, you know, make sense it, to anyone else. It just needs to make sense to you. And, and yeah, you know, I yeah. recommend doing it. Yeah, I think, you know, having a journal when you're, when you're traveling is a wonderful thing, because also it's something to do when you, if you're sitting in a, alone at a restaurant, or Absolutely. Um, you can just take out your journal, and, and also not just the what you're doing, but like, what are you smelling? What do you, what do you, uh, it, all the other senses yes. that you have, um, that will just help evoke mo more memories, um, that can be really wonderful, too. Absolutely. So, yeah couple of questions here. So I'm just going to go through some of them. There's a question. Do you always get your own room when you're on a group uh, trip? Yes. And the reason I do that is because I do write. And if I had somebody who was a chatterbox, you know, we, we would not get along. <clears throat> and I don't want to feel like I'm rude to them, but I need the time and space to be able to write. Yeah. Do you ever hitchhike? When I was a whole lot younger, I did. I hitchhiked <laughs> all over Europe. 
and, and in the US for that matter. I've, I've hitchhiked a lot, but I haven't done that in many decades and don't think I'll ever be doing that again. <laughs> um, and your third book, I know you're, I, you, you told me you've got so much content you're thinking about a third. I can just imagine the whole series, like the whole, you know, Karen Gershowitz Wanderlust uh, yeah. series so that. <laughs> Well, this one's a little bit different, actually. Um, it's a travel book. Um, but what it's about, and I've started interviewing people, and if anybody's interested, um, you can contact me because I will interview you. And it's about how travel changes as you get older. Because when I went looking, there's lots of advice on how to get insurance and what to do if you get sick and all of that kind of stuff. But nothing talks about how much fun it is to travel. And for those of you who don't know, I have a very bad back. I, in fact, I had spinal surgery two months ago. And um, it, it limits some of the things I can do. You know, I, when I was younger, I climbed Kilimanjaro. I, you know, I, I went canoeing, I, you know, all kinds of things that I cannot do anymore. Um, it, they are physical impossibilities for me. But it doesn't mean I can't still travel and have fun. And as I've started interviewing people, I've heard some incredible stories, um, even from people who are perfectly able-bodied, but who are changing the way they travel as they age. And so that's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be a bunch of stories about experiences of traveling as you get older and, and mm -hmm. what you do and how you change what you do. Yeah, I, I know we we talked a bit about luggage and I used to, I used to be the backpacker and I, travel for three months at a time with a backpack and uh after my last trip to Mexico I said okay that's enough I because it's not that it hurts now but I think it will hurt later <laughs> so yeah. so um so and also I've just decided I don't still want to lift all that weight I don't I don't think it's uh very good for me so um so yeah you have to do what's right for you right and yeah. uh, not worry still... what everyone else is doing no, it's still so much fun. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to travel as long as I possibly can. And I've got a lot of good examples of people traveling, you know, way into their 80s and 90s. And I'm following in their footsteps. That's that's my plan. And I, I was actually, joke, I, I was going to say, sorry, and I joke okay. that when I can't do it anymore, virtual reality will be so good that I will <laughs> stick on a headset and travel virtually. That's my plan yeah. for what happens when I can't really travel. I was at a book launch yesterday of a 91 year old uh, woman traveler who just wrote her memoir and she's still going strong. So, you know, I'm with you all the way. Absolutely. Um, there's a question here, how did COVID affect your travel? I know you have a chapter in the book on that too. Yeah, um, like everyone, I came back from London on March 16th of 2020, which was the last day that regular flights were coming in to New York, which is where I live. And, um, and I was not, I was supposed to be there a bit longer, but I changed my flight. And then for the next year, I didn't travel at all. But what I did start to do when I started getting completely crazed being at home, was figuring out where I could go in and around New York City and looking at New York as if I were a tourist in New York City. And I discovered places, and I'm a native New Yorker, I was born and raised in Manhattan, um, and then lived you know, in and around the New York area for most of my life. I was discovering places that I did not know existed. And it was great fun. And I developed this huge love of street art. And now anywhere I go, I have to go see street art. Um, one of my friends can attest to this one. I was visiting in Colorado. We had a day, an extra day. And I said, let's go to Cheyenne. I was like, Cheyenne, why would you go to Cheyenne? I said, because there's supposed because A, I haven't been there in a long time. It's not a long drive. And I understand the great street art. Well, we went up to Cheyenne and much to her amazement, it was not so amazing to me. They had fabulous street art and it was absolutely great fun. We had a great day. Um, and almost anywhere can be great if you if you go there with some intent and then are open to what's there. We had a great meal. Yeah. It's great. You know, it was really fun. Um, and it was like Cheyenne. 
Yeah, so, yeah. Why? I I did something similar, you know, the first summer of COVID, I decided I was going to travel around Toronto and I looked for really unique places to stay. So um, in small towns mostly. So I stayed in yurts and tree houses and tiny houses and a gypsy caravan and like a boat, a boathouse. And I just decided I would travel at home that way. Yeah. And it actually made the experience. It was like I had fresh eyes um, enjoying these places that I had been to many times, but now I was seeing it, you know, from a different perspective. So it was really fun. Absolutely. It kind of kept me going. Yeah. Yeah. And I really did discover tons of places that I had no idea existed, including parks and sculpture gardens and I mean, all kinds of stuff. And then um, when I could start to travel and things were beginning to open up, I was still not exactly willing to get on an airplane. Um, so I did car trips and went, you know, went north, went south, went west, you know, absolutely everywhere. Um, yeah. And, and took about six or seven car trips before I finally got on the plane and started, started doing, you know, more, more distant travel. Yeah. There's a question here, the most underrated country. And I'd, I'd like to ask that, but I'd also like to twist it a little bit. Like we always, you know, we're thinking a lot about less travel places and travel in the off season and things like that. Maybe even a country that that's had a bit of a reputational problem that you think actually deserves more attention might be another way to, okay. to look at this. Um, Korea, South Korea. It, I had never been there. I don't, very few people go to South Korea. We had such, I had such a good time there. And it was um, not what I expected. People were incredibly, unbelievably friendly. The food was fabulous. They have a design sense that is very different than anywhere else. Very um, unusual and wonderful. Very modern. We took a day trip out to um, a ceramics village. That's the only thing there. Uh, they have a huge ceramics museum. And again, given my background, I was interested in that. Um, and then they have a village where there's uh, 50 or 60 ceramicists and you just go shop to shop and look at everything. We went to the market and looked at the silk that was there. And it was a visual feast. The colors were incredible. Um, I was taking pictures. I must have about 200 pictures just from in the silk market because it was so extraordinary. Mm. And, um, you know, and there's lots of monuments. I mean, there's a lot to do in and around, I'm, I would like to go back. Um, and I don't think most people, that's on most people's radar because most people, there's very few tours to South Korea. And um, I'm not sure we saw any other Americans there. One with a friend and honestly don't remember, don't remember seeing very many other Americans, if any, and it's very safe, very safe. Mm. So, you know, underrated, I would say that's an underrated place to go and fascinating, really fast. Yeah. What about the opposite question? So, you know, a place that you've been to that you'd say, Dad, nah, don't waste your time. Everywhere has something interesting. I knew uh, you would say that. <laughs> yeah, they, they, it does. Um, there are certain cities that I won't go back to. Um, and I, I've been in Bali three times. And the first time I went, it was one of the most magical places on the planet. Uh, the people are incredibly friendly. They have all these ceremonies that you can go to. It's colorful. The food is wonderful. The, it's very lush and green and there are gorgeous beaches. And it was amazing. The second time I went, it was starting to get built up. The third time I went, um, I love the Aussies, but they had taken over. And you couldn't even find a place that was in a remote area that was not overrun. And so I went to the next island over called Lombok. And Lombok, people were not traveling to because it's primarily a Muslim population. It is equally beautiful. It is half the price and fascinating. And we, when I went there, um, there, had, there had been a bombing in Bali 
about a month before. So tourism on Bali was way down, but on Lombok, it was almost non-existent. And they were giving, giving rooms away. I mean, I stayed in a villa and I literally mean a, one of the most gorgeous places I've ever stayed for 40 or $50 a night. Um, and it was amazing. But it, again, I don't want to go back to Bali because I still have this pristine image in my mind. Yeah, it's hard. And, and it is very difficult to go back and see something that was absolutely beautiful, just overrun. My favorite was, I, I have a picture of a, a sign that said antiques made to order. And I'm sure there were lots of people buying antiques made to order. <laughs> um, there's a question here about how do you find places to stay? Um, do you have a resource that you use? And I'm gonna plug ours in a second. Um, all the usual things. I don't think I do anything that's really unusual, um, except that when I'm in country, I'll ask. I will ask people. Um, but, you know, I'll look on, I, I actually will never go on Airbnb, not because I don't like Airbnb, but because of my back. If I go to a place that doesn't have a good bed, it's, it's a disaster and there's no way of knowing. So I tend mm -hmm. to go to, you know, kind of brand name places because it's so important. I didn't used to, I used to go, I would go anywhere, but I can't, I literally can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. We've, um, we're just trying to, I put the link in the chat, but we're just starting up a, a new part of our website with recommended places to stay by women. So, um, so if you have a place that you'd like to suggest, we're kind of trying to get it populated so that we can all learn from each other and share our favorite, um, our favorite places. Um, there's a question here about unusual food. Um, favorite food, <laughs> least favorite food, birth, food worth traveling for? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, my least favorite food. And you food just came back from that. Tuscany, so, you know. Yeah, well, that was, that was <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, the food there, you couldn't have a bad meal if you tried. The food was just incredible. Um, I also happen to love Japanese food. So I, you know, I'm, I'm a sushi person. So I, that, that always makes me happy. Um, but um, the food that I can't, that I think is the absolute worst food I ever had, and we were just talking about it, was if you go to Peru, um, not so much in the major cities, but if you go elsewhere um, and you go into someone's home, which I went into several people's homes, running around the kitchen are these furry little creatures. And I thought, oh, isn't that nice? They've got bin guinea pigs as pets. And then I realized, no, those are not pets. Those are dinner. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh no. <laughs> and I actually got served a guinea pig with the little beady eyes staring at me. And I was like, oh, how do I eat this? You know, this I can I see everybody going like this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, oh, Th that possibly is the worst meal I've ever been served. Um, and then the other thing is I, I spent, I've spent a lot of time in Japan. Um, and the first time I went, there's a ceremonial tea that you get served and it's kind of this yellowish green. It's very intense color and foamy. And the first time I was there, they handed me a cup of it and said, um, you know, they were not speaking English. I was not speaking Japanese, but I got the idea. You had bow. Yes. You know. And I tasted it. And if you've ever bitten into an unripe persimmon, you know what the feeling is, which is it makes your mouth pug up. You go, but you have to drink the whole thing. And then we go to another ceramic studio and I again get served it. Now I see the color and I know what's coming. And, and then I went on business trips to Japan numerous times and was again given this ceremonial cup of tea and I would cringe every time I saw the color, just because I knew, and, and you cannot refuse, so, mm. yeah. That's great. That's the other thing is, um, it, it's worth saying that I've always traveled for fun, but I managed to get a career that sent me all over the world, um, and that was fairly deliberate on my part. I, you know, I wanted somebody else to pay for it, and I got sent 
not to little tiny places, but I got to see all the major cities in the world doing business. And it's a very different experience working in country than being a tourist. So I, yeah. it was a different perspective and a, and a very, very interesting. And I, that, yeah. that I miss it. Yeah. But, well, we're getting close to the end here. Do you want to take a moment and just let us know when your book is available, where we can get it? Yep. Well, the first book is out and that book is Travel Mania. That's been out for a couple of years and you can get it on um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, Indie, uh, I forget what it's called. But if you go on to, by the way, you should go onto my website, which is karengershowitz.com. And you can see chapter by chapter for Travel Mania, the photographs that go with the stories. And um, it will be up on Wanderlust and it'll give you links on my website to where you can buy the books. Um, Wanderlust is, is for pre-order because it's not, the, the issue date is October 3rd. That's, that's pub date, um, but you can pre-order it and the other one's already out there. So right. and, it's, it's, and it is already up on all the major, major booksellers. That's great. Well, congratulations on, on doing this twice and looking forward to the next ones. Hi. And um, uh, you're, you're an inspiration to all of us. And I'm really happy, you know, if, if the women on this call haven't read Karen's articles, please do. They're all great. And I think if nothing else, it'll inspire you to get out and just see the world with new eyes and with fresh eyes. So, uh, which is a wonderful way for us to be as travelers. So thank yeah. you, Karen. My pleasure. And I really do encourage everybody to get out there and, and go see the world. And if you don't want to go far, see the world that's close to you. As Carolyn was saying, if you really just start looking close, close to you and don't go to your usual haunts, you will discover things in your own backyard, no matter where you live.